I'm looking in my Webster dictionary. I want to pull up a word a little later. So let me just do that. So you'll I'll be able to reference that. Praise Jesus. We're on session three, Nehemiah series. And this is going to be chapters five and six. And these, this is probably the most interesting movement of sound and people and opposition and accomplishment and victory. So I'm really looking forward to what we figure out in these next two chapters. Next week we will, I'll, I'll tell everybody afterwards. Heavenly Father, thank you. First off, you possess the blueprint for the city that you're building and bringing into fruition and completion the new Jerusalem. You possessed it at the time when time was not, before time began, before the foundation of the world. You knew exactly the complete work and you set it out and you've caused men from those days of Abraham on to rise up and leave everything and seek a city whose builder and maker is God. And we are these people again, recognizing that there is movement, there is new sound, there is new designs, there are new ways of thinking, ways of being, ways of living, living from, living to and toward. So we are those people and we're here tonight asking you Holy Spirit to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Reveal to us the things that are coming, the things that are happening, the things that you're unfolding and bringing forth. And as you do, Lord, then cause us to come into fellowship and oneness and union with the things that you've set your heart to do. And then as we journey with you forward, then make them, make us tangible examples for you make us living stones and you make us temples at the same time. So each of us hold within us the very, all of the components of the temple of God as well as all the components of the city of God. So we ask you to do it in us, with us, through us, for us. Glorify your great name in every way, in everything you're saying and doing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first two chapters in Nehemiah, we won't review other than to say that it was critical that Nehemiah walked through around the old city and looked at it as it stood. And then somehow he had the capacity to call people to rise up to build. And they then began to find their place on the wall, which is a great question to be asking. Lord, where, would be, where do you want me to build? And when it says they repaired the city, the word repair means to fasten, like we think of mostly it's used to be strong in the Lord or to strengthen yourself in the Lord. And it is, so they were, they were causing something to be fastened together and growing up. And all of this can happen internally. And I think all of it is to happen first always internally before it happens externally. It happens inside of me before it happens outside of me. So Nehemiah called the people that began to build and then the, the warfare increased. And we're going to get into even greater warfare <clears throat> this, this uh, next couple of chapters. But one thing I'd like to suggest to everybody to, to be building inside of you, because these are the, this is the, these are the four components that God had me, has had me meditate on for 16 months, and I'm, there, I'm, living, I'm loving it. I'm enjoying it. It's changing my entire life and freeing me up in every way I can imagine. It's changing my image of God and the way I respond to certain situations and the way... I anticipate God's response in situations. It's just recreating, renewing an image of the Father in a, in a glorious way. The first was what happened to the Apostle Paul, and it's the word salvation. So if you remember the word salvation. And what we mean by that, again, we all say, oh, I know what salvation is. Yeah, but I don't really know the kind. Of, I haven't witnessed too many salvations like Saul of Tarsus. But I think we better, we better start seeing them pretty quick. Because the world's shifting, you know, in a very negative form and hatred and fear is taking over. But God's about to overwhelm them with love and liberty and salvation, that kind of powerful. Which so Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. You want to write those down? But the word is salvation. 
meditate on it. He said, learn the new mo- the model. This is the model of salvation you're to anticipate, expect, and look for. I'm going to move in liberating people from the inside out. And with salvation always accompanies salvation in com- is inheritance. Inheritance always accompanies salvation. And what does that mean? That means that when God brings me to repentance and conversion and to my sins being blotted out, he also brings me into the, into the knowledge of inheritance, the inheritance I was given before the foundation of the world. So Timothy, Paul was telling Timothy in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, don't be afraid, stir up the gift, and remember this, that it was before the foundation of the world you were saved and called in Jesus Christ. You are not saved, and then we'll figure out how well you do with your salvation to see what kind of job we give you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You were saved and called. In fact, because they're one of the same, and, but yet they're the who I am and what I do. The who I am is this, you know, my, my place, and the, what I do is my job. So inheritance, and that, for us, as a company of people, the, this came, again, 16 months ago, and I meditated it. I delight in it. It, it continues to un, unpack for me revelatory imagery that's just amazing and that is Jeremiah 33 because Jeremiah 33 says that it when the nations hear of all the goodness and the abundance of prosperity that I provide for you they will fear and tremble I will I will and it's just a a a powerful demonstration of God setting things in the order that he called them to be without the ability of man to bring them to be. And so it's, it's it, but meditate there. It begins about verse 6, goes to around 22. You'll know. It's not hard to, you know, I, I just remember chapters. You find your way in the chapter. You'll always know where the spirit rests and pick it up. But meditate that. What would it, what would it cause my neighbors to take notice that God was moving? And again, we're a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom that we're coming that's coming to overtake all other kingdoms and all the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our Lord is a spiritual kingdom that rule, it has a whole different value system and a whole different operating system. It's, it's not apple to word or word to apple. It's like, you know, it's never been. This system is, is totally takes over every other system once the leaven gets in. So salvation and then inheritance and then the third word is love. And that's, that's it, you know, again, these are words that are so challenging to me because I've tried to live them and failed miserably in them and therefore really kind of had decided they were just kind of good truths and, and ideals, but I didn't really want to, there's no way I'll ever do it. So I play tag with the Father now. They're all about Him. Jeremiah 33 is all about what He does to release His inheritance. Acts 26 is all about what God does to bring salvation and um, 1 Corinthians 13 is all about who our Father is. The most loving, long-suffering, kind, non-envious, without any need to show off or draw attention to himself or puff himself up. This glorious God of love. God is love. And so to meditate on that. So salvation, inheritance, love. And then the last is liberty. I believe the, these Words for me, they're not the, the words that I've known them to be. I'm almost 40 years old in Jesus, so I've, that's not the first time I've heard any of those words, but it's certainly a whole new paradigm. I am intentionally worshiping to encounter God in these dynamics, in my spirit, before him. No pressure to produce them so that I don't have to limit how big God is because I have to keep him about the size that I can wear. Right? We limit God because we can only put on so much so we only let God be as big as we can wear. But if I don't have to wear it and I just get to enjoy him, the funny thing is he starts to tran- I start tra- being transformed because I behold his glory. And glory is the, the imagery of transformation. So love, liberty is Luke 6. Luke 6, again, is out of the Sermon on the Mount and it's where we, the whole dynamic of the kingdom Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, 
Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who hits you on the one side of the face, let him hit you on the other side. And that doesn't mean like a slap on the face. That's taking one of those rods, like bamboo sticks, and pow, 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 repeated blows on the side of your face. And then after it's done, you offer the other one. Now, I can't do that. But God does that every single day. And, can, and that's how he is. It's not, he's not restraining himself. He's absolutely wants humanity to strike him because he's the only one that could absorb the strike and bring salvation out of it. He's the only one who can restrain himself, so to speak, and never change and never be provoked because he's love. And so it's, it's a huge paradigm. Salvation at the, at, the, at the display of the Apostle Paul coming out of Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. The um, inheritance as, as seen in the demonstration of Jeremiah 33, in the renewal of taking desolation and making it the sound of the bridegroom and the sound of the bride and the sound of joy and the sound of, gla- sound of gladness. The exact opposite of reality and God's ability to say, I can even do it while you're saying this, I'll, you'll start hearing that. Talk about change. When we're saying desolation, we'll start hearing joy and gladness. We'll hear a new sound in the midst of this current confession of the over the place. So that's, to me, that's just, I just go and I say, Lord, how would that feel? What would that look like? I worship you for doing this. I acknowledge your sound, your promise. And then the same thing would be with love. You are this glorious Father. I mean, when you start meditating on the character of Father, then you can't be tricked to believe that he's all of a sudden mad at everybody and deciding he's going to just judge America and throw her down the toilet as though we really had something redemptive in the first place. (laughs) You know, it's all a Jesus. It's always, will always be Jesus. We walk away from Jesus, we'll act stupid. We walk toward Jesus, we'll look really wise. But it's all Jesus, and without Jesus, it's nothing. So he's shifting some of our things that have been permanent in the sense of their temporary permanence they're falling apart, but the eternal is just keeps coming up so that everyone can behold the lamb, the lamb. The only one we get to behold is the lamb. And then the whole idea of liberty, um, you know, the liberty to lay down our life for a friend, to, to take, let our soul, you know, lay down our soul for someone else's need to have their soul rise up, to... Uh, take, uh, take blows to have the long suffering, the goodness, long suffering, and forbearance of God so, so vibrantly in, in, amongst us that we can all begin to become really free because we're not all restrained. So, salvation, inheritance, love, liberty. I thought to myself earlier, to, oh, that's, that's SIL, S I L L. I wonder if there's an English word. So, I went to my Webster's dictionary, which I'm so grateful for. You have, you know, my gift of language, you need this. Still, it is, um, no, it's not still, still, come on. That one would work too, right? (laughs) We just need a T, right? (laughs) Let's find another word. No, I didn't try to dream these up. A shelf at the bottom of a window frame, window sill. A piece of wood, metal, or stone at the bottom of a door frame. A part of the frame of a car that is directly under its doors. A horizontal, this is the full definition, a horizontal piece as a timber that forms the lowest member or one of the lowest members of a framework or supporting structure. That makes sense. It's foundational. The horizontal member at the base of a window, the threshold of a door. I believe these internalizing this idea of, of salvation, and I'm not looking for it just to go reach the guys in ISIS. I want it to reach me. I want it to be impacted to the fullest extent of salvation. And literally, that's what Paul said. He said, I spent my life letting this, this revelation of salvation keep affecting me. To now, it, is, it means all of this in Acts 26. The idea of inheritance, this this God that can turn neighborhoods, change nations, transform settings, shifts us from this 
combative mode to this redemptive experience. You're going to hear from Randy Needy tonight and Hannah, who are currently ministering in Patia, which has been not a glorious uh, reputation because during the Vietnam War, the, the soldiers would get their R&R and they would go to, off to Little Sleepy Thailand and to this little sleepy village and they, would, they started popping up to bars and then it came to prostitution and now it's you know, one of those sex tourism capitals. And, and you know, we get to accept the, glory, the, you know, the, the joy that we kind of created the, the demand. But they're in there thinking, no, this, this, is, a, this is God's city. It's going to be the place where he's going, his throne will be seen and love will be felt and women will be redeemed, men will be redeemed, life will flow. And, and that's, that's that sound of redemption. So that's that foundation. Love, this, 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 God is moving toward the earth in love every single day. And everything we're going to grow up into is going to be just carried by love. Love will cover the multitude of sins and... And then the whole idea of liberty being the kind of liberty that allows us to lay down our life and, 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 and to give away and not ask back and to lend and not expect is mind-boggling. But I'm meditating in it because I need it to build in. It needs to become just the fabric of who God is in me. Not who I am, but who God is in me. So that who God is in me then can begin to act out how God likes to act out. So for all of you and joining us on this series, build, think of those as the, the threshold that you're going to step over, the foundation which we're going to build upon, the whole idea of the depth and wealth and the breadth of salvation, the inheritance that God has not just given us, but his ability to bring it into to manifestation, love that is way over the top, 1 Corinthians 13, but is the kind of love that is who God is, not who we are, but who we become as we behold him. And liberty as the, as the kingdom of God, the way it operates, just this freedom. So when you, I tell, I worship God, I tell him, you love your enemies. I worship you, Father. I worship you for you're the only one and truly the only one that originates love from yourself toward your enemies. And you do good to those who hate you. And then you just start to do that and it just radically rearranges your imagery of God. No matter how holy he is and how he hates sin, that starts swallowing up that hate and that holy step away from me, you're too dirty to be near me mindset. And you start realizing, no, you took care of that in your son. You made the heaven accessible. You made humanity bearable. You made us adorable. You move in the heart you've always had you not only are justifier, but you forever have justified. It just, you'll radically revolutionize your mind, your, your image of Father, and so doing the way he operates, and then so doing, you'll be able to stay on task. Because now we're going to Nehemiah, and we're going to chapter 5, and we're going to, it's, you're actually, I think it's good that we took this time to bring this to bear, because the, the wall is being built up, things are happening, all right, we're going to go to Nehemiah 5, and it says, there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. They, these were also, there were also some who said, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. Okay, so in a difficult, a, a, a difficult economy they're in, there was also some who said, we have um, yet... There are also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Just difficult, difficult times. Yet, now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren. Our children is their children. Indeed, we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. So what is happening is... We have to start intentionally building outward or upward into the kingdom and, and together. And soon as our enemy on the outside starts to be kept at bay, then the issues on the inside start showing up. And this one's going to be like the one that's always going to show up. It's debt. Unresolved issues of forgiveness, holding men in captivity. And in this case, you know, literally we're a few making a lot of money and a few making 
and many making little money and they're taking advantage of the poor and the poor being put in a position of having no resource and you didn't do bankruptcy, you sold your kids into slavery to pay your debt and so that's where they're at. Amongst the brethren, not, not the, the, the Arab brethren outside. This is just amongst the Jewish brethren. They're in their struggle. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. Okay, and then verse um, 7. After serious thought, that's a, that's a New King James dilution, a diluting sound of the English. The Old King James says, I, after consulting with myself. I love that. After consulting with myself. I thought, what, is that? what does that mean? It means to reign or to ascend to the throne inside your heart. So he came, you see, we're not a people that are going to be able to react to the environment we're in and solve the environment's problems anymore. They're too big. We're going to be people that have to come into the, into the place of the reign of heaven and the rule of God and just get his counsel and then move with authority in that direction. Like, Paul, like David strengthening himself at the, at the news of Ziglag being burnt and everybody being taken. Strengthening himself in the Lord, then inquiring. So it says, after serious thought, or after I consulted with myself, or after I had ascended to the throne within my heart, I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting interest or usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. And I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren. We who are, this would be a, a picture of a solemn assembly, a recollecting of ourselves back to a new standard, out of the standard we're stuck in. Uh, you, according to our ability, we've redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now, indeed, will we even sell our brethren or should we be sold or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. For new standards to be introduced, God has to sovereignly release the kind of, ah, you got me. That isn't okay now. It was okay yesterday because everybody was doing it. Now it's not okay at all because we see it for what it is. It's just continuing the same spirit that we came out of. Slavery, slavery. So it's just an incredible thing to happen. You're dealing with debt. It's always going to be forgiveness. Forgiveness is just so much the key of moving forward. Then I said, what, are you do what you're doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also, with, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and drain. Please, let us stop this usury. Whether he's saying, oh, I recognize that we're doing it too, or we're loaning without interest, which would have been the right way to be doing something, I don't know. But now what he declares over everyone, restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses, also one hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine, and the oil that you have charged them. That's Jubilee. That's the year of Jubilee. That's happening in this moment. And think about that idea. Think about it in your own personal life. Think about what that would mean if you're the one in the debt and have no right to your land because it's mortgaged and over here and over there. And, or you're the one that's holding debts over people and what that would mean to your portfolio because all of a sudden you don't have what your portfolio once said because you released it back to the people. Radical thought. Radical thought. Radical thought. Radical thought. It would change. It, and for this to happen, it says, um, so they said, we'll do it. We'll restore it. And we will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priest, required an oath for them that they would do according to his promise. So there had been a cluster of nobles and rich people that were controlling a whole group of people that was putting an undue burden on everybody. And now they were going to be really big and really gracious and really generous because they, had, they were called to do so. And there always is that sound that starts to shift something. The ones who have are the ones that are to give and the ones that have not are the ones that are to receive. And something like that starts to happen. It starts with forgiveness of debts that are owed and it goes to selling of homes and laying the money at the apostles' feet. It, it goes to, it's all giving and forgiving. It's all leaving and losing. It's all what allows us to detach from the circumstance of life and become reattached to the God of, of our destiny. And it, so it's happening. They shook. Then I shook the fold of my garment. Can you just see this guy just whipping up his apron? 
And he said, so may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen. And praise the Lord. And then the people did according to this promise. Huge, huge, huge. In my book, Forgiveness, which we got to get some more copies of that. I talk about this as a national reformation. And one that really literally shaped the completion of the city. If that, this hadn't happened, they would have collapsed under their own weight of their own guilt and their own debt and their own loss and their own inter- unreconcilable junk. And they wouldn't have been to get a clean slate. It's, Father wants to push delete every night when you go to sleep. Delete. All that was not proper, all that was not good, all that happened, wonderful. Delete. We'll start a brand new day tomorrow. Wash away everything. We'll start a brand new day with joy. That's how he... He wants us to look at, good night, Papa, delete. What we choose is say, good night, Father, and we push, repeat. <laughs> Not really wanting to, but kind of hoping that the next day really won't be like a yesterday, but we're going to have a chance to do it right this time. And it's, it's so funny, but that freedom to say it's really free. Moreover, from that time, <clears throat> next few verses, he says, He talks about that he did not take advantage of what was allotted him. He tried to just hold it inside of what was required and needed so that he could, again, demonstrate, you know, the being the giver, not the taker. Like Jesus saying, the rulers of the Gentiles, they always lord over everybody, but not so with me. I'm your servant, so that's how you're going to follow that example. But the former governors who were before me had put burdens on the people, um, or let me... Jump to verse. Moreover, from that time that I was appointed to be the governor in the land of Judah, and from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, which means 12 years he was there, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provision. But the former governors who were before me laid their burdens on people, took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued the work of all on the wall. I did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers besides those who came from the nations around us. Now, which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sleep sheep, which, you know, you'd have to that many. De- but it's all these details. And then he says in verse 19, remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. There is something of that heartfelt integrity that says, okay, I'm just going to do this unto the Lord. And because I do it unto the Lord, I do it in a different standard because I want it to be out of the fear that I have for you, God. And that's addressed twice in this chapter. Fear of God caused me to do these things. And the fear of God needed to become back on the noble people's rulers so they would return to a, a, a right belief system. The Bible taught, and don't put your brethren under slavery, but they were allowing that to happen. So it's just the fear of God is, is, makes us depart from what is destructive to us and allows us to return to the Lord. So now we jump into chapter 6. This is, boy, you could study this chapter. This is like high level, and I don't want to say high level like Ooh, I want to hope I get there. No, ooh, I don't want to ever be here. This is the kind of stuff that is really tricky. Now, it happened when Sambalat, chapter 6, and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of all our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates. So the wall is up to the full height, the, the gates are in place, but the doors are not there yet. So there is still vulnerability, but to the enemy, they're realizing, wow, identity is really getting established. The place, whoa. Then Sambalat and Gershom sent to me, saying, come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Oh, no, let's don't go there. (laughs) Not in the plain of Ono. (laughs) But... When our, in, when our adversary realizes that he's losing, he tries, to shi- he tries to shift us out of the place we're winning from to a place he can overthrow us. And it says that, so I sent messengers to them. I love what he, Nehemiah could say. I am doing a great work. 
I mean, that, that's, I want you, let's try getting up tomorrow morning, no matter what your day looks like, no matter how you feel about yourself, and say, I am doing a great work. Because that's what we're a part of, the great work of Jesus maturing himself and revealing himself in us. I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave and go down t- to you? That's another picture. A lot of times we think that if we disappear, it really won't matter. But yes, it will matter. Everybody has to be in their place. Otherwise, there's a chunk of the New Jerusalem stuck somewhere by Saturn. It's all together. Everyone, everyone growing up into him who is the head. Every member supplying, every joint supplying, everybody doing according to what they were called and made to be from eternity. Just once it starts functioning, boom, it's a whole life transition. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing. I'm doing a great work. And if, why should the work cease? Because I'm not here. But they sent me the message four times. And if I know anything about the devil is he's persistent. In fact, he's shameless, so he doesn't matter. He can ask you a gazillion times, right? He has no shame. He just absolutely just will keep looking to see if one day he asks you the same question and you say yes. Then Sambalat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. Oh, now we're going to put, send it to the editor. And it was written. Uh, it is reported among the nations. And Geshem says, is that classic? I mean, now we're just going to use slander, intimidation, and accusation. Just roll them all together and put them on the paper. Whoa. And again, thank God that's not happening to us individually or us corporately. But it certainly can happen on the front page of your newspaper that you wake up reading in your brain. That accusation, all that comes across. It says that you are, Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you're rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And, now now here's, this is really getting dicey because we're now going to start using language that we have considered sacred language that can only be used by God and we're going to start letting anybody use this for any means. And that is the sound of prophecy. It says it's been heard, it said that um, you, have, um, you have appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying there is a king in Judah. Now, that is, is a temptation that we can all look for a prophetic word to establish ourselves. And it can be an accusation people can put against us when it's not, not anything is happening in that manner, but it's the way it's being heard. And so they said, you come, to, come, so come, therefore, and let us consult together. Still trying to bring him into the trap to kill him. Still trying to disengage him from the work he's doing. Still trying to threaten him, frighten him, intimidate him, accuse him, blah, 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 blah. Boy, Nehemiah must have been pretty important. And think about how, some hard, how, how hard it is sometimes just to get to church. That's how important you are. Every one of us are absolutely vital. And he wants to just disengage us. Then I send to him saying, no such things as you say are being done. But you invent them in your own heart. <laughs> I love that. For they all were trying to make us afraid. Saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will be done. Now therefore, oh God, strengthen my hands. Today, while I was walking and spending time with the Lord, he brought to my attention, he says, you want to know the longest, um, the one 24-7 that I can't wait to get finished and that no longer have to endure? And he reminded me that in Revelation 12.10, it says that when the accuser is cast down and salvation and power and authority and the kingdom of our Christ come. It is the accuser who has accused them before God day and night. And the Lord began, when I wrote my book, he gave me the clarity to how to explain it. How does the accuser who has no place in heaven any longer accuse us before God? And this answer is quite simple once you realize it. We do. He puts the sound in our heart. He gives us the words in our mind. He creates the imagery in our emotions. And we go and accuse ourselves of this or that that God already took care of through Jesus Christ. Or worse, accuse God of this or that, that he's not faithful and can't do what he said because of the way circumstances are. And so the sound of prayer 
that goes up to the, church, to the Father, by and large, is in sound of accusation. Because there's nobody agreeing with Jesus in the completion. There's nobody saying, you know what, I'm just going to say that you're good, and, and I, no matter how it looks, how I feel, you're good and you're God and I love you. And I let you slay me. I'm still going to trust you. I'm not succumbing to the circumstantial crazies, the, the mind warfare. So that 24-7 is going right now, day and night, accusation about us to the Father. And Father, and to uh, it's just a sound that is, when that sound is removed by the accuser having no place to hold that sound, then he gets thrown to the earth in a terror, in a fury, and we start reigning from a whole other realm of undisputed authority, undisputed power, undisputed salvation, undisputed kingdom. It's just huge, huge. But how hard is it to go through a day and not accuse yourself yeah. and not accuse God and not accuse someone else you heard about or not accuse your enemies? How, you know, it's just so much a part of the fabric of our being. It's, we're, we're, it's like, you know, we just don't know how it would ever be. So it's a practical, this is such a practical picture because he is getting these kinds of innuendos and they're all trying to get him to act on them. And he's saying, no, I'm not going to act on them. No, I'm not going to go. No, I'm sorry. No, you're not going to make me afraid. Lord, there's pressure coming. Give me more strength. Strengthen me. Strengthen me. So afterward, I came to the house of, look at this one, Shemamiah, the son of Delaiah, the son of Methebel, who was a secret informer. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they're coming to kill you indeed at night they will come to kill you now you're getting someone who sounds like he's your friend and he's here on your behalf and he's here to protect the work of the Lord he's going the opposite direction and I said should I such a man as I flee and who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life I will not go in you're seeing the, you're seeing the whole components of Revelation 12:11. The blood of the lamb, the word of the testimony, not loving your life unto death. That's the key right there. Well, I die, I die. Then, once he had made the declaration, no, I'm not going there, even though that's tempting. Then, then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he had pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Now, there's nothing more frightening than when you start hearing sound coming in the voice of prophetic imagery and people will you know you think that doesn't happen just ask Job and his three friends they whole the whole theology of one of, of, of his friends happened by a vision of a dark thing going past them they, they totally got a demonic interpretation of Job's situation and they built an entire theology from it and they were prophesying but it was not the voice of God they prophesied. It was the voice of the evil one. That's why they ended up getting so racked. And why? Because they said, Job, you've got a problem, but they wouldn't give him a solution. That's the cruelest thing in the world you can do is to point out a person's sin and not give them a way out. And that's why most of the time Jesus said, why are we getting into the sin thing right now? Let's get into me. Come away with me. Come take a look at me. Come behold me. Did I tell you I was love? I tell you I love you? I tell you I died for you? Did I tell you I justified you? Did I tell you that I ascended and then I stand in front of the Father for you on your behalf in his face? Did I say you get to stand with me? Did I tell you how good you, what I did is so complete that it'll never be altered? Nothing you can do can take away from it. Nothing you can do to add to it. It is forever sealed that sin was dealt with then, now, and forever. Did I tell you that you really don't have a sin problem? You have an image problem? You're beholding the wrong thing? Behold me. Come on, this is who you've been created to be. I redeemed you to be me. I call in you into my image. Look at me. Come on, look at me. Come on, don't be ashamed. Look at me. I am not mad at you. Come, come. And when you start getting that peering from behind that veil, behind the fig leaves, and you start beholding, and you go, oh. the transformation is, is, is effortless and is as because it's been done by Jesus and it's not sustained by us. Does that make sense? We cannot sustain this. The New Jerusalem will not pay the power bill. <laughs> Jesus pays the power bill, right? He is the light of the day. We don't even need a sun. He's just... 
We're, we're coming into this total redependency. So for this reason, he was hired that I should be afraid. The thing is about fear, 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 and act that way and sin. Try to save my life when I should just let it die. I have done that a hundred times, if not more. I got to a point, and then it's the fear of death that drives me back, and I freak out. Oh, no. Oh, no. I just can't go on for this or that reason. And that they might have a cause for an evil report that they might bring a reproach against me. So my God, remember Tobiah and Sembalat according to these works and prophet, the prophet, prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. So this intensity of warfare is it, okay, all, the, all the war that we've incurred, everything, our words, Everything has been words. There's never been a sword pole drawn. There's never been an arrow shot. There has never been an army that has assaulted uh, Jerusalem. From chapter 2 to chapter 6, it has all been words. Therefore, why we think it's strange when our whole mind is assaulted, our emotions are ravaged, and our whole our place of safety is assaulted. It's all internal. It's sound. It's fear. It's imagery. It's trying to get us to act in the sound so that we then de desist from the work and disengage. And then we go into condemnation and ja, ja, ja. It's just hell. But Jesus is Lord. Amen. And he is bringing forth a sound that's going to have greater authority. And that's why I meditate on the God is love and I meditate that God acts like Act Luke 6 and so I don't buy some of those prophecies that I used to buy. Yeah. I don't listen to some of those. You better get out of here because there's something really bad's going to happen. That's the silliest thought that Christians ought to flee when good, bad things are about to happen. Yeah. I mean, seriously. Okay, place is going to go really down. Get out of here. Yeah. When we're the only ones that could save the thing. Yeah. We're the only ones that carry the light. And if we die, we just get to go to heaven so what matter? See, that we're, we're having our mindset change, not because we want it. Trust me, it's just happening. But when you start going, aha, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elu in the 52 days. Wow. So chapter 2, chapter 1 through chapter... Chapter 1 is like a four-chapter, four-month project. Chapter 2 through chapter 6 is a 52-day. And then the next 12... Next six, seven chapters are the rest of the 12 years plus coming back and putting things back in order because it's a lot of you can, build a, you can put brick wall together pretty quick but to change this whole mindset excuse me, this whole mindset everything that we address in chapter 5 returns back to its original state of decay and de de destruction you know, returns back to the, the image that was address the, the slavery, the neglect, the compromise. It just all goes back to exactly where it was within a short absence of Nehemiah. And I think Nehemiah's Holy Spirit. A good pre-incarnate imagery of Holy Spirit. That's why I keep saying, Holy Spirit, you liberated me. I need you to occupy me. Yeah. If you're the one who got me free from my enemies, don't leave me here. You'll create a vacuum and we'll have a worse situation. I do not want a worse enemy to rise up. Come on, just keep filling me up. Take over. Get a hold of me. I'm doing something squirrely. Get my, get my attention. Demand me to change. I can't do it myself. Call me to the place. Give me the equipment. Fix me. Convict me. Heal me. Deliver me. Come, Holy Spirit. More, more, more. And that, that Nehemiah rose a city up. And so it happened when our enemies heard of it. And all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that the work was done by our God. May it be so. May it be so. Therefore, um, oh, let's keep going. We got 15, verse 15. Um, so the, um, verse 16, no, let go to verse 7, yeah, verse 17. And in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Dubai. Now watch this. You just... Golly, I mean, who would have ever thought? In those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. You know, Tobiah is one of the bad guys. And letters of Tobiah came to them. 
Good communication. Great. Good idea. For many in Judah were pledged to him because he was the son-of-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son Jehohanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Barakiah. And also they reported his good deeds before me. Oh, Tobiah, he's a new guy. He's just great. We, he's part of us. He's, you know, he's one of our cousins. You know, he's one of the Ammonites. He's, he's really terrific. He's, and reported my words to him. Did you know Nehemiah's not buying it? He's standing, you know, he's... And Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. You wish it would all go away. You just wish it would all go away, but it just doesn't seem to. Somebody found another way to bring Tobiah in the house. And by the time we finish this in a few weeks, you'll be surprised where Tobiah ends up at the last chapter. You'll be, oh, how in the world did Tobiah get there? <laughs> it's easy. But praise the Lord Jesus. We're going to, let's take a moment and pray. And let's open our spirits to disarm the frightening reports we're hearing. Wherever they're coming from. Whatever they're pressing you against, against you. From doing the great work you've been called to do. Whatever you and I have been called to do individually and collectively, God considers it but a great work for his purposes. Father, I ask you, Holy Spirit, come now. You who are the Nehemiah, the comforter in our life, who comes alongside and call, adapts yourself to where we are, but always knows where we're, supposed, where we're going and where we're going to become. Come alongside us right now. And as the frightening letters have come, or the alluring letters, or the threatening letters, or the debts that have accrued, or the, or the preoccupation with stuff that shouldn't be mattering, our life being more about what we have to manage and being free to live for you. Lord, wherever these entrapments that we've read in chapter 5 and chapter 6 may linger, or may be lurking, lurching, or, or just imposing themselves in our soul. We ask you, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Shabbatama. Come Holy Spirit. We welcome you to walk through the inward part of our being, the internal part of our city. The relationships, the sounds, the letters, the decrees, the things that have been said over us, said about us, inferred, things that are trying to direct us away, direct us in, or even make us go hiding. Shababa hara mama tu Holy Spirit, you know. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, as you begin to unveil and reveal these places where lies have been sent as truth and, and to be received and acted upon as though they were legitimate or accusations that were sent that we must go prove wrong, not true, when there's no need to prove anything. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come in the strength of your might. Come in the brilliance of your light. Come in the, in the separating capacity. Because you are the spirit of truth. You are the spirit of grace. You are the spirit of glory. You are the one that can set order in, in chaos. And you can bring peace in confusion. So come, Holy Spirit. Shabur I welcome you, Lord to your official building project, us. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Ooh. And Father, where we are in relationships that are so subtle because they're through subtle connectivity to friends and peoples and marriages that we have no way to just dis totally disengage from but they come again as barrages we say Lord you are the only one that is greater than you're even greater than that you're even greater than our in-laws and our outlaws you're greater than those who would stand in our house but only to listen to what we say to gather iniquity to themselves you are greater than these looming threats and, and fears that would want us to change our course because it is dis, disrupting their comfort. God have mercy. Grace. 
to the whole, whole factor of change and transition. Grace to the building. Grace to the builders. Now let's say together, I am doing a great work. I am doing a great work. Let's say it again. I am doing a great work. One more time. I am doing a great work. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's who you are. That's what you are. That's what's happening because of you. God bless you. Bless you guys online. Next week, those of you are later on, on demand, it'll be right there to click. But next week is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So we're not going to have a class. And the night service will be for a night of giving thanks because we always make it a point to do a night of thanksgiving to God before we go and enjoy Thanksgiving with family. So God bless you. We'll start up in two weeks then. It'll be the 2nd of December, I believe. All right. Bless you. We'll start service in 10 minutes, and you're going to love Randy and Edie and Hannah. They carry this sound with them. <laughs>